Desde muy pequeña no acostumbramos a vivir así en invasiones. Nos acostumbramos a estar en los huecos, que haciéndole favores al otro, lléveme allí, tráigame esto, para ganarse una y salpecito. La plata mueve todo. Y usted con la necesidad de tener sus hijos, cinco o seis hijos en la casa. Que es buscar la, la delincuencia o estar en el narcotráfico o las drogas. Quiero parecer el tío, parecer la misma. Vale, vale, que tenemos el tipo. Dinero, no son buenas cuentas, no, 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 Ahí está, boa. Todo completito, bueno. Si tiene que entregar eso ahorita para que nos muestren donde lo tienen que mandar, nos va a hacer. Que no me están ahorrando. Sí, mira, ustedes que son que los piratería y tocan más una cosa. Ese último son muchos riesgos que hay. Los piratas son los que le quitan la droga al que se duerme, a los que. ¿Sí me entiendes? Tienen muchos riesgos de que te quiten las cosas. Llega un momento que todo llega a una sola cosa, a violencia y muerte. Lo más bonito, la esquina más, más grande que hay en esto. Last offer Kicksville. Public enemy number one is drug abuse. Just say no. Halting the drug problem in America is like carrying water in a sieve. Take my word for it, this scourge will stop. There's now an understanding that the war on drugs was an abject failure. You have to stop and ask yourself, how did we get here? We will build a wall. I grew up in a town like Happy Days, and there weren't any drugs, no guns, no violence. And when I went up to California, my intention was to go to Long Beach State College and complete my degree in marketing. Suddenly, everybody was smoking marijuana. And I saw the value in selling the marijuana more than getting high off of it. My name is George Jacob Young, spelled J-U-N-G, okay? And what I'm known for is being one of the major drug smugglers in the world. The money was just rolling in and you know, of course, it was tax-free. 
But I became bored with that, as a matter of fact. I wanted more. I wanted more thrill, more adventure. So I convinced my college buddies to get involved, let's get on to Mexico and get our own pot. We went to a place called Puerto Vallarta. And couldn't speak Spanish. And after five days, we couldn't even find a joint. My ego was kind of shrunk down to zero. And a little yellow Volkswagen pulled up out front of the bar. And this little blonde girl got out. And she came right to our table. She said, you know, I've been watching you guys for like five days. She said, you've asked everybody in Puerto Vallarta for marijuana except the police chief. She said, you need help. I said, yes, I do. And she said, I live with the guy who can give you all the marijuana you want. And I said, let's go. We went over to meet him. And he said, are you going to get it out of here? And I said, uh, fly it. And he said, you have a plane? And I lied, and I said, yes, I do. I said, I can get one, and I'll be back with it. So then it was time to learn how to fly. I did this for a considerable amount of time, and I was making a ton of money. But they finally caught up with me. I was looking at five years in the federal system. The judge was about to sentence me, and I got up and I said, it's ludicrous that I should be sentenced for taking a plant across an imaginary line. <laughs> and he said, that may be true, Mr. Young. And he said, unfortunately, it's against the law. And so I got the five years. My mother grew up in this part of town, which was the only place that you can actually smoke reefer, you know, have a couple drinks, bet a little on numbers, watch rooster fights, and maybe go and have a good time with a prostitute. I'm talking about 1950s. There were still muddy streets, horse-drawn carriages. My name is Michael Colon Blanco. I'm the youngest surviving son of one Griselda Blanco also known as the queen of cocaine. She told me that she remembered being so poor, she didn't have no shoes or sandals. And my mother said to herself, the day I have children, I'm gonna make sure they live in the lap of luxury. The neighborhood was divided between these two local street gangs. And she started to date a kid from the other part of the neighborhood, Pestanitas. Pestañita ran bootlegging, he ran a couple prostitutes, he sold some weed, and he met this little girl. She was uh, 14 when she fell in love with him. They got married, and he introduced her to marijuana. They've been drug dealing together, right? They were getting money. But Pestañitas told my mother, we're making peanuts here. If we can get this weed to New York, we can make a big load of money. So they relocate to New York, and they start doing deals in New York. When they start making serious money, my mother goes back to Colombia and she meets a gentleman who was a club owner. And the gentleman told, tells him, you might want to think about this drug called cocaine. This is Jackson Heights in the borough of Queens. It's one of the places where cocaine comes home to the United States. 
This has become the central distribution point for the majority of all the cocaine distributed in the northern United States. You just stand here and watch these people. That's exactly what they're doing right now, is they're doing business. In the early 70s, Griselda becomes the queen of queens, Queens, New York. She's selling cocaine. My mother realizes that this is the future. Cocaine was on the rise. The demand was starting to increase. At JFK Airport, the seizures were from a pound or so or two pounds on the body to two or three kilos in the suitcases. We were starting to see other methods. Anything that could conceal cocaine was starting to make its way in more frequently. And Griselda Blanco's fingerprint was on that. I was sentenced to Danbury Federal Correctional Institute. And that was how I met the infamous Carlos Slater. Carlos was there for stealing cars and shipping them illegally to Columbia. I said, well, basically you're a car thief. And he said, what about you? And I said, I flew plane loads of pot out of Mexico. He said, do you know anything about cocaine? And I didn't. He said, you can buy it for three to $4,000 a kilo in Colombia. And I said, well, how much is it all for in the United States? And he said, 60,000 a kilo. And I said, you know what, Carlos? I think you and I got to go into business together. Griselda entrepreneured the cocaine industry as we know it. From the jungle, to the street corner, to the nightclub, to the household. My mother did that. What's the first place people are gonna buy drugs at? On the corner. What's the second place people are gonna do and sell drugs at? The disco. It's the epitome and the era of disco music. It's three in the morning in Manhattan, and still at Studio 54, people crowd the doors, hoping to get in. My mother liked to rub elbows with the elite of the time. Society columnists adore Studio 54 for the personalities it attracts. Studio 54, practically on the joint. Studio 54 was lined up for blocks. And everybody started cocaine in there. Saturday Night Fever with Senorita Cocaine. It took over America for the rich and famous. The number of people snorting cocaine is rising steadily despite the steep price. About $100 for a gram, enough for several people to get high at one party. Cocaine paraphernalia is selling well right on Madison Avenue. Who is buying this? Everyone. From the secretary, lawyers, businessmen, old and young. We have customers in the, in the entertainment business, but most of them are executives. Well, it's not a serious problem nationwide, given the very large number of people who use cocaine. It is a serious problem for a certain small minority, and those tend to be people who are very wealthy, 
for whom money is, is no concern, who can get unlimited access to cocaine. Cocaine at that point really wasn't in law enforcement's radar. And so there was a gap in the intelligence that was being developed. And this gave the Colombians a opportunity to establish a greater foothold for smuggling the drugs into the country and distributing the drugs without being caught. My mother makes a fortune in New York City and moves back to Colombia. And her and Capitan see that their empire has grown so much that they need henchmen, they need soldiers. And everybody knew that if you wanted to get into the cocaine business, you had to get the green light from Griselda. Pablo Escobar's boss was one of those smugglers. My mother didn't like him too much, so Pablo killed him. And my mother said, Pablo, you got a future, kid. It wasn't until later that I realized what a role she played, not only in the cocaine business, but also in the business of violence. She was a psychopath. She loved killing people. In the beginning, I really liked her. He was young, well-mannered and educated. He had an innocence about him also. I would describe my father as a rebel, adventurous man. He was a chilled person. He loved his music. He loved to be around friends, peaceful, sometimes introverted too. I figured a great guy to meet and to work with and we could make a lot of money together. Next thing I knew, we were on our way down to Columbia to meet a guy named Pablo Escobar. A lot of people asked me, was I an R or whatever? I mean, he could have been a vacuum cleaner sales, but I didn't know who the hell he was. We talked, and he said, I have one rule, you betray me, and I'll have to kill you. And I said, well, you'll never get to kill me because I'll never betray you. I mean, it's a simple rule, right? You know, people walking around the ranch, all the machine guns and this and that. That wasn't my trip. I, I just wanted to get in and get the hell out of there. Pablo Escobar industrializes the cocaine trade. He gathers a big group of different traffickers based in the city of Medellin. And they begin to pool their shipments and work together. And then Carlos Leva brings the mass transport element via planes. He provides the air bridge then there's the retailers, the Griselda Blancos, others in the US. They are running the distribution networks and then funneling back the money to the cartel. Carlos later is to the cocaine smuggling business what the Wright brothers were to aviation.
When I first met Carlos, it was simply to purchase some airplanes for him. I never used my real name. I went by an alias. He got a hold of me and said, hey, I got this place in the Bahamas. That's where we're going to operate out of, and I need some airplanes. So I picked up a couple airplanes for him and flew up to the Bahamas. And Carlos said, hey, you want to fly down to Columbia, fill them up, and bring them back to the islands and make a little extra money? And so I said, yeah, OK. Carlos was very convincing. You know, the smile on his face and how great it is. So consequently, you'd kind of insidiously get involved in this. I mean, I had no desire to be a criminal. I had no desire to go to jail. One of the most favored routes from Colombia to Miami is via the Bahamas, famous for its beaches, casinos, and hundreds of thinly inhabited keys or islands that have been used for smuggling for centuries. The flying was not nearly as dangerous as hanging out there overnight in Colombia. Uh, these little strips are out in the middle of nowhere. I remember sleeping in a hammock with a 38 on my chest because there were some people that would come in with automatic weapons and steal the product. If you messed up, you weren't getting out. If you, as others did, crash an airplane at some of these clandestine strips in Colombia and you were injured, the narcos buried you with the airplane. They didn't take you to the hospital. So there was a great incentive to successfully land and take off. This is an old saying that marijuana business is done with a handshake, and the cocaine business was done with a gun. <laughs> People walking around with guns, and everybody had one. It was very serious, and mistakes weren't tolerated. In the drugs business, all roads lead to Miami, Florida, America's biggest banking center outside New York. Cocaine dealers regularly pay cash for a $50,000 car, a $100,000 yacht, or a million-dollar condominium. One of the side effects of the cocaine trade was the impact it had on the economy and the, the amount of cash that was free-flowing. The money that was coming into Miami was just incredible. I remember we would have to go to the Federal Reserve Bank, and there were just pallets and pallets and pallets of cash. Many times, the Federal Reserve Bank of Miami had more cash than all the other Federal Reserve banks put together. purchased Norman's Key for what I was told at the time was $2 million. So Carlos had actually purchased the island. And he wanted to build like an empire there, a drug smuggling empire. Using a front company, he acquired most of the property on the island and turned it into a drug transshipment port. It was full of naked women, parties, and cocaine everywhere. Armed bodyguards walking around the perimeters with machine guns which he imported from, from Germany. Norman's Key was approximately 200 plus miles from the east coast of Florida. So it was a very easy trip for a light airplane, which would draw no suspicion whatsoever because a light airplane didn't have the range to go anywhere where this merchandise was picked up. In the beginning, it was all fine. And Carlos changed drastically, did like a 180. And I told him, I said, this is crazy. The other way to do this is to keep on the move and keep changing locations when nobody knows who you are or what you are, and you keep moving. And I said, everybody in the world's going to be watching that island. And they were. It was a madness. And that's when I decided it was time to go.
Anybody who thinks they're a drug lord, they're living some kind of foolish, childish dream. Once you get on the list, it's over. Si usted le bota el miedo al arma, va, va a ser, cuando vaya a hacer un trabajo vamos a ir seguros. Porque usted tiene miedo, o nos lleva o la ley, o nos lleva al objetivo. O por lo general en el objetivo se gastan tres y se guardan tres para salir del problema. Manden una frente y la aseguren, den entera. Los tres disparos bien seguros a la cabeza de una. Listo. The first Chicago motorcycle hit it was done by Griselda's killers, and they weren't young 15 year old, 16 year old boys. They were grown by deals. It was a different time. My mother never believed that a boy should get involved in men's stuff. Griselda comes to Miami. You have an industry that was trying to be established by other Latinos. But now, this corporate entity came into town and said, no, 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 this is my town. I don't care what you guys think, I run all the cocaine. My mother always told me, you know what's the best way to take care of your competition? Erase your competition. Then you have nobody to compete with. Right now, two people are dead, and there are others injured. I don't know the exact amount. Police say they don't know what the motive was for the shootings, but they are sure it wasn't robbery. The shooting occurred in the middle of the day in a very popular shopping mall called Dateland. Inside the liquor store, one Colombian national and another non-Cuban Latin suspected of drug trafficking lay face up in a pool of blood. They were well armed, we can say that, and they came prepared to do battle. The subjects went inside with automatic weapons, killed the intended target and his bodyguard inside the liquor store. The shooting continued outside as the assailants sprayed gunfire all around the parking lot. Shell fragments were found some 40 yards from the store. They fired automatic weapons into the sidewalk area, wounding two other totally innocent bystanders. Witnesses were just beside themselves. They couldn't believe the fact that they were in minding their own business, shopping at a suburban shopping mall, and ended up being shot at with machine guns. It was totally unprecedented. No one had ever seen anything like this before on any homicide scene. This was the handiwork of Griselda Blanco. She loved to make that statement and the bloody trail continued from that point on. That day, 1979, I think Miami and the United States understood that cocaine would generate so much violence and so much financial gain that people were willing to kill people in broad daylight, innocent or not innocent. <laughs> Last week, the bodies of two Colombians were found. The majority of murders here are related to drug trafficking. Colombian drug dealers have opened fire in crowded shopping centers along busy highways in quiet residential neighborhoods. This Colombian was machine gunned as he sat in his car. 514 persons have been murdered in Miami this year. 
there's no end to the selection of weapons that they have here. That they're a lot better armed than law enforcement. We became known as Dodge City. What I see going on here would make Chicago in the days of prohibition look like a Baptist Sunday school picnic. Our homicide rate doubled from 300 a year to 600 a year. We were all overwhelmed not the least of which was the medical examiner's office, which had to use a refrigerated truck to store bodies. The primary target of Metro-Dade homicide was Griselda Blanco. She not only wanted the person shot, but she wanted the person's wife and even the children shot. She was a monster. Initially, he'd try a little bit of the product occasionally, but it got to the point where he was, I believe, addicted to it, and I think that really distorted his perception of what the operation was. And He became a different person. He was very paranoid. He ran around with the 45, waving it around, and he never knew what the hell he was gonna do. He just had this attitude that he was the king. That's when I decided that this could get dangerous. I mean, it's time to say sayonara to this activity. Colombian drug baron Carlos Leda had armed guards to prevent outsiders landing by boat or plane. For yachtsmen, this island had a menacing reputation. Sometime after I left, one of the most famous news anchors in North America, Walter Cronkite, sailed into the harbor at Norman's Key and was met by a couple of fellas that were sporting AR-15s. And when he asked what the deal was, they told him that he wasn't welcome on the island and he should just get in his little boat and sail on out of the harbor. Cronkite wasn't going to be put off like that, so he opened up his own little investigation, and one thing led to another, and eventually the Bahamian police were convinced by the U.S. authorities, DEA and what have you, that you need to do something about this island down there. Cause became a Freudian kaleidoscope of madness because on one end of the spectrum, he, he loved John Lennon and he loved Adolf Hitler. And that was mind boggling to me. It was on the news, on the radio, on the streets. We had the army coming to our house almost every day looking for him. As she began to create more and more enemies, she wasn't able to really enjoy the fruits of her endeavors because she was on the run. I would always wonder why we had so many people with me. And my brother would tell me, you know why, why? Because you're the prince of this family and nothing's gonna happen to you. Her husband, Dario Sepulveda is growing weary of her. He's disgusted with her. Talk about the pot calling the kettle black, right? He's an assassin himself, and even she was too much for him. He's worried about the well-being of his son, Michael Corleone, and he takes Michael and goes to Columbia. Well, Griselda wasn't having any of that. And a short time later, she pays off police in Colombia. Dario is driving down the road with little Michael in the car. And after a couple minutes, four cops, two motorcycles, pull us over. 
And he handcuffs my father. My father goes, what are you doing? And my father looks at his bodyguard. And I think right then and there, they realized it. And I look at my daddy. It's your puppy, puppy. My dad was hit by 27 bullets. I saw the ojos on his back. And there was all blood coming out of him. I was about to be six years old. Griselda Blanco ordered the hit on her husband, and there's no doubt in my mind that she didn't care whether her son saw the assassination or not. All he knew was that he was whisked up, put on a plane, and delivered to his mother in Irvine, California. And shortly thereafter is when we arrest her. She was just propped up in bed reading the Bible. She didn't have the 38 in her hand that was on her nightstand. I said, hola, Griselda. She looked at me with a very bewildered look. No, me amo Betty. I said, nah, I don't think so. And I put the cuffs on her, and away we went. The maid had taken little Michael down the street to go play at a park. We didn't want him in the house. You know, it was going to be too traumatic. He was as cute as a button playing in a playground. Just a nice kid. And it was so sad. And I remember commenting to my wife. I said, you know, I really feel sorry for this child. I wouldn't mind taking this kid and adopting him myself. I only had the opportunity to meet Carlos Leather for one or two weeks in the Hacienda Napoles. They became very close friends. Uh, they were both against the extradition. They were very close, but they always kept their families away from everything. Sadly, Carlos Leather lose all of his money and power, and he was consuming a lot of drugs. Colombian law enforcement officers have not said exactly how police were led to Later's house in Medellin, but that Later was set up by one of his alleged partners in the cocaine cartel, Pablo Escobar. The story is that there was a big party in Pablo Escobar's hacienda, and Carlos Leder arrived coked up, and one of Escobar's sicarios makes a pass at one of the girls he was with, and Leder just kills him. And so Escobar has to smooth all this over, but elements of the Medellin cartel then see Carlos Leda as a liability. Escobar sees the need to appease US and Colombian officials who are applying increasing pressure on him and his organization. And Leder gets offered up as the sacrificial lamb and essentially turned over by Escobar and Medellin cartel associates. I remember the day of my father's arrest. I was with my mother, and I can still feel how her face turned white and the screams. The plane from Colombia carrying reputed drug king Carlos Lader touched down in Florida early this morning. Security was heavy. Gun-toting federal agents circled the courthouse in Tampa where he was taken. Justice Department officials describe Lader as one of the most violent drug dealers ever captured. I was looking at more than 20 years in prison, straight up. The judge said, when you were young, you had $100 million. And he said, nobody knew who you were. Why didn't you just take it and go away? And I had an answer because I had figured it out a while back that 
It wasn't the money anymore. My father knew what was going on for years, and he said, you're a thrill junkie. He said, why don't you become a race car driver or something like that? <laughs> Escobar sent my wife to visit me, and she said, he wants you to testify. And I said, I won't. She had my daughter, who was, I don't know, four years old, and with her, and she looked at me and she said, this time, he's not asking. I was six years old when we needed to go hide because Escobar was looking for me. He knew the love that my father had for me, and the perfect way to silence him is to threaten his little girl when his trial started. You can't even imagine that it's possible, but they say that at war, everything goes. It is one of the biggest victories in U.S. history for drug agents and federal prosecutors. Now that he's been convicted, later faces a life prison sentence plus 150 years on top of that. They saw him as a trophy, I say. He wrote his first letter, and he promised me that he would be home by Christmas. And now it's been 33 Christmas waiting for him. You've done so much bad in your life, that type of beef never goes away. That type of generational hatred, revenge, it don't go away. So after eight years of my mother's release, she was killed. Exclusive details for us, Brian. Tom, Pablo Escobar is, without a doubt, the most powerful and ruthless of all the drug bosses. It's believed that his cocaine empire has made Escobar one of the world's richest men. Worth estimated at $3 billion. Escobar's ranch is a monument to his illegal trade. The plane over the gate is the first he used to transport illegal drugs. Those who would challenge Pablo at his own game learned he would do anything to win. Cocaine bought these 10,000 acres of mansions and guest houses. Quite a haul for a man who began his career stealing gravestones and cars and working as a golf caddy. Una revista nacional calcula su fortuna en cinco mil millones de dólares. ¿Es esto cierto? Eso parece una cifra de esas que se ven solamente en los cuentos de las mil y una noches. <laughs> 